Welcome back. Today's video has got to start with some pretty insane numbers. The sixth game ever to break the 1 million concurrent player barrier on Steam, with more than 5 million sales in three days and a 93% audience approval rating. So yes, uh, Pocket Pairs Pal World has had a truly staggering weekend. Even for a concept that could be pithily summed up as Pokemon but with guns, yeah, it's doing well. Yet all that good news and attention has brought a lot of eyes onto the project, and because of that, well, this game is being dogged by allegations that are fairly serious. We've got artistic theft, the company's previous support of AI art, and plans to have four games in early access simultaneously. So how the hell do you reconcile all of this into ultimately what will be one of the biggest successes that 2024 is going to have? Well, today we're gonna to find out along with our sponsor. Well, guess what? It's time to level up IRL. If you wanna learn those high paying superpower STEM fields like data science, computer science, and maths, you can learn by doing with brilliant.org forward slash bellular news. The first 200 to go there, get 20% off the annual plan and they've got a 30 day free trial for you. Now, data. The world is full of data these days. So are our video games. And real talk, those who can think through data in their heads are real powerful. And that's why I think you should get started with the basics of data science, where you'll learn all the key concepts that you need. Then you can progress into more advanced topics like applied probability, which is one that is really fun. Lots of great brain twisters. Doubly so because it's all interactive examples, fun analogies. It's an approach where if you don't know, that's completely okay. Uh, seriously, this is the way to learn. If I had a time portal, right? I would bring Brilliant.org to my younger and terminally bored at school self because this is how you learn and enjoy knowledge. Sharp, practical STEM fields help us both in our jobs, yes, but also they help us cut through all of the world's BS, right? That's awesome. So learn by doing at your own pace on both the web and through their delightful app. Be one of the first 200 to click my link, brilliant.org forward slash bellyler news, and you'll get 20% off an annual plan and a 30 day free trial. I don't know about you, but I first found out about Pal World when I was browsing the Xbox store. And when I was on there, I mean, I looked at it and as the trailer went on, I just got more and more baffled. Like my eyes didn't quite believe what was going on. And I just assumed it was some sort of parody game because basically, yeah, I saw Pokemon and I saw Pokemon with guns. That's been everyone's initial reaction, right? Pokemon, but with guns. The thing is though, there's also stuff around, uh, well, the town. There's using your pals as shields and as weapons themselves to fight enemies who themselves have guns. So even though this Pokemon like thing has always appeared with this game, this is uh, absolutely not a Pokemon game. It doesn't really play like one either. And this is something that the developers themselves have tried to downplay from the start. They've actually been comparing their game to Ark and to Rust, which does make a lot of sense. Essentially, you could reduce it all down and say that it's Ark survival evolved with automation and resource management, some edgy humor um, of, say, a RimWorld-like game, but dressed up in something that looks like Pokemon Breath of the Wild. It really has everything. Survival mechanics, base building. I mean, just about every thing that you could sort of imagine would lead to a lot of natural Steam success, or for the low price of 27 bucks, or of course, Game Pass. Now, especially on Steam, the survival game audience is extremely dedicated. They really kind of do just sample every game out there, right? The thing is though, this has exploded far, far, far beyond that. The devs essentially have done a great job of getting this in front of like VTubers, streamers, all of that. So you're dealing with a low price functioning game, unlike the day before, a mimetic appeal, and just a lot of people, like, I mean, that mimetic appeal, obviously that makes it explode in YouTube, explode in Twitch. It ends up being the thing that everyone's talking about, including for things the developers may not necessarily be too thrilled about. So let's get into these allegations. Look, the very obvious thing to talk about is the designs of the pals. They're not particularly original. Now, look, yes, there's only so many ways you can design various monsters of a sort of set archetype, but the thing is, the way that they have specifically done them is extremely similar and I would say quite derivative of Pokemon, um, including like a lot of Pokemon fan designs that honestly do just kind of look like they were lifted, changed slightly, bit of a different color palette. It's certainly, it is quite undeniable when you just look at the comparisons. And of course, to a degree, that may be even a sort of intended thing. I mean, think about the mimetic spread of this game 
for a lot of people, what they'll talk about is, oh, look, it's it's a Pokemon, but with a chain gun. So this immediate comparison has basically just kicked up a lot on the internet, which is, I think, very understandable. Now, it's not like they have been, uh, you know, hiding that they're drawing inspiration from other games. Even, I mean, take a look at the Arc inspirations. The core UI is pretty much the same, right? Like, a lot of things are suspiciously similar. That's what many people would say. For me, it just comes down to this. Yeah, you can take inspiration and you you can do this and you can get away with it. You're, you know, it's, it's not like you've stolen something. The thing is, though, you'll probably do better if you put your own spin on it, right? There'll be a lot of value in that. That said, it's not like they necessarily needed to deliver any more value because, um, yeah, well, the sales numbers certainly speak for themselves. So overall, does this mean that there are plagiarized designs? Have Nintendo Legal just had their most productive Monday morning in history? And that brings me on to this cute little fella, Spark It. Have you seen anything like that before? I mean, not exactly like, because that doesn't really look like Pikachu, but it's obviously super inspired by Pikachu. Now, is Nintendo going to look at that and say, aha, we're going to sue you? Probably not. Like, yes, there's loads of overlap, but it, it is different. They're not really going to go for something like that. But where things get a little bit more spicy is, uh, well, this, which has been pointed out. It was highlighted by VGC. And this is just a comparison, right, between two different models. And the thing about this is, I mean, look at them. You do have some different, like, sort of fur details, but the core proportions of the model, I mean, they are identical. Take a look at the tail. Take a look at, at just, like, a lot of the shapes, the proportions, all of those specifics. It's the sort of thing where, you know, back in the day, let's just say not dealing with 3D art, this is when somebody maybe on, like, DeviantArt would say, hey, you just traced my thing. A uh, big problem that would happen is people, and we've seen this actually happen in games as well, where you would see a character in a pose and then somebody would say, hey, I, I drew that pose for my character or my piece of work. You've clearly just traced it. I mean, it could happen that they just happened to make a virtually identical model, including like, you know, the... Um, the very, like, minutia, you know, the proportion of things. It's probably more likely that it's, you know, traced, and if we're going to entertain that discussion, perhaps we should also entertain that uh, this could just be the model. Because look, no matter what game you play, if it's one of the big enough fandom, you can just get 3D models of things. Like, people have unpacked Pokemon games, so yeah, if you want a... Uh, uh, like an, an FBX of a Pokemon, it's probably floating out there on the internet. After seeing this, VGC decided, hey, we're called Video Games Chronicle, so let's go talk to people. They talked to some AAA game artists, and this is what they said. You cannot in any way accidentally get the same proportions on multiple models from another game without ripping the models, or at the very least, tracing them meticulously first. One senior character artist told VGC anonymously, adding, I would stand in court to testify as an expert on this. On the top of plagiarism then, we've certainly went from, uh, you know, it is what it is, creatively bankrupt, but not really crossing the line, to potentially you have ripped these things from another video game. And uh, that uh, obviously is not something that is, uh, that is proven. It would probably have to go through some sort of legal process. It could be the case though, now that PAL World is out, maybe if you're Nintendo, you can start to take a look at this because, well, you know, so many people have now got these models and they can compare them. And obviously, you're dealing with Pokemon. It's an absolutely ginormous fandom. So people are going to find out everything that there is to find out. As for how this has kind of been responded to or what we understand from Pocket Pair themselves, their CEO confirmed that any designs and artwork for the game would have been reviewed by a team led by him. So he is sort of saying that he's taking responsibility for any such designs. This perhaps is something that could bite him in the ass depending on on how things go. Um, but at the time, though, when he said that, he was explicitly asking audiences to stop threatening the community team and the artists based on, uh, like, sort of conspiracy theories and that sort of thing. Things are maybe a bit more serious now that it's out. VGC, as of the time of writing, were not able to hear back on the model comparison from Pocket Pair. So, this is one area of drama. We're going to set that aside and move to another one, and that is AI allegations. So, AI, it's an interesting thing. We can see lots of cases of AI for good. As an example, medical imagery. A lot of coders, um, like my, me, myself, um, other coders that I know are actually getting basically rubber ducking. It's really useful. Where it gets kind of worse is where you have 
griftery bullshit. And then something transforms from being a really useful tool to sort of clear out some drudgery, to help actual human work and learning, and then it turns into cheap bollocks for grifters. Which is not what we want, because that makes games worse. What about the AI thing? Is this somehow being uh, implemented to blend Pokemon together in some sort of horrible, you know, Ripley-style, kill me now, homunculus, what's going on? Well, here's the thing. Right now, there's really no way to prove AI with this game, right? That's basically the situation. I'm sure that there's fact-finding to do there, but there is kind of no hard evidence that has really been found, but there are suspicions. I think we should try to stay in the realms of where things are a bit more concrete, and with that, we can talk a little bit about Pocket Pair's history. And that's when we get to the previous game that they released, which is called AI Art Imposter. This is a carbon copy of a hit tabletop game that is called a fake artist goes to New York. Basically, each player is given something to draw, except for the fake artist who has got to bluff that they drew the same thing, and if they don't get identified as being the bluffer, then they win the round. So, AI Art Imposter is basically that, but with an AI generator. Instead of drawing, everyone runs the tool and generates art that has got to match the theme. The game itself is basically, I mean, look, it's incredibly cut and dry with the Pocket Pair CEO even talking about the hosting costs of the AI generation from them. Now, he himself has talked about his interest in AI before. He previously helped found a crypto exchange. So I suppose for any of you in the audience who are maybe thinking of like, um, you know, the sort of grifty boxes to tick? Ah, uh, yeah, maybe that's another one that's been ticked. Who else has ticked that box? Square Enix. So I suppose they're, um, yes, they're in good company. Now, in the case of Art Imposter, we basically don't know, like, what that stuff was trained on, so that's a, a whole question there. Uh, but overall, then, for some, they feel uncomfortable with the PAL world thing because of this prior game. And the reason there, uh, for a lot of people, it's not necessarily the idea that, you know, some machine learning is being applied to make an image. For them, it is how the machine learning often is trained, where it's essentially scraping things. Now, the AI advocates would say, well, you, a human, how do you learn a new thing? you probably learn it by looking at people's copyrighted works, because when you make something, the copyright defaults to you, uh, which is different from, say, a trademark, which you've got to register yourself. So they'll sort of say, uh, hey, whenever you like, say, say you like Nathan Falk's art, and I mean, man, his art is incredible. Technically, you're looking at his copyrighted work with your eyes, and then you are trying to, you know, uh, learn from his techniques by analyzing his image. So the people who are the advocates here would say that the AI is doing that. The flip side of that then is the people who are more against the AI in art. They'll be saying, okay, so you're basically just scraping all of our data. You're throwing it into the big homunculus and you're basically just making a black box that can regurgitate my art and my art style. If you were to go to like a mid journey and Think of a scene and then just say Simon Stalinhag. You're going to get shitty Stalinhags out because it's obviously gobbled up his work and tried to learn from it. Now, that can be a bit of a problem if you are Simon Stalinhag and that's your art. So you can really see why for a lot of artists, it, it's actually, you know, there's a phrase, right? Where I agree in a way with what the AI people are saying and the anti-AI people. And what I'd say to sort of try to square these two sides and maybe further the discussion is, it's just a case of the dose makes the poison. Because, yeah, technically, that, that's like what a, what a human can do. And you actually look at some cases. I remember an interview with a really interesting guy who was a art, not art thief. I mean, you probably say that too, but he was an art um, faker, right? And he just had this incredible ability to look at a piece of art, replicate the thing to the point where it was so good that, uh, well, he could sell the forgery. And uh, this was something he was doing as a part of uh, as a part of crime. Now, I believe in this case he was doing it uh, quite a number of years ago, where like the methods to sort of weed out that sort of thing weren't as uh, sophisticated. But in a way, if you're saying the dose makes the poison, he's going to be like a superpowered human who's really good at the forgeries to the point where his ability to synthesize somebody's style and technique and then reproduce their specific work. That's just an ability to learn so fast that you can translate near perfectly. And that, that's a kind of crazy thing. It's like a level of power that actually does change the dynamics. So it's a fascinating situation. And as much as I'd like to say it's all okay, as long as the, uh, you know, the image AI is being trained off, say, a stock library where, you know, the proper rights and licenses have been secured, 
actually, a lot of stock libraries themselves are being flooded with really bad AI generations. So ultimately, this is a problem where, as is pretty normal in human history, what we can make our technology and our machines do is vastly outstripping us being able to use it ethically and vastly past, say, um, effective legislation around the issue, which is why continually, you know, with the DMCA and quite a lot of these laws, this is stuff governing the digital age that was, like, you know, written into law years and years and years ago to the point where now things are just kind of different. To move on, then, we got to talk about the early access model. So, AI Art Imposter has not seen an update since March 2023. It is still listed as an early access title. So it's not ideal for a company to have two early access games in development at the same time, but you could say that with different teams within a company, uh, that's not impossible. But if that was the case, then Art Imposter would surely be still getting updates, right? Thing is, though, uh, Pocket Pair have actually made two games before that. We've got Over Dungeon, that is Slay the Spire, but with some Clash Royale in it. That entered early access November 2018, fully released August 2019 with patches since, and people are mostly happy, so I suppose thumbs up there. We then, though, have Craftopia. It's essentially Breath of the Wild, but with survival, base building mechanics, as well as some creature capturing mechanics. It was on the, uh, the Xbox pre you. So flat out, if you've been browsing games on your Xbox, like you've probably seen this and yeah, that's the same company. And certainly looking at Craftopia, you can absolutely see where, well, Palworld came from because it's just sort of adding elements to Craftopia. Now that being said, per their CEO, Craftopia and Palworld have been made by entirely different teams. Um, so I suppose technically there's nothing that stops both of them from just progressing onwards. But that is not actually easing the concerns of the Craftopia audience, because you can now see they have got mixed recent reviews. People are basically a little worried that, well, this is now the third early access title that this company has. With AI Art Imposter, the updates have stopped, and they're now kind of wondering, like, are we just going to stop getting updates for Craftopia now that Palworld is the big thing? And that's kind of tricky, because if you're a pocket pair and you've seemingly found lightning in the bottle... Uh, you're probably going to want to put all your resources in that, right? Now, this is a feeling that is not improved by their uh, next plans because they've got another game. They really are productive. Uh, it's called Never Grave the Witch and uh, the Curse. It releases at some point in Q1 of 2024. It's a Metroidvania that is Hollow Knight, but uh, sort of like with Wiccan stuff going on that is also coming out into early access. Look, there's no smoking gun here necessarily with abandonment. It's just a business practice that to some people isn't feeling quite right. And that's why you've seen that uptick in negative reviews for Craftopia. What I have enjoyed, though, is the likes of this, which, um, yeah, I have no strong feelings, but every time I see gameplay footage, it looks like this. And if you look a little bit closely, what do we see? We see, um, you know, the UI of every game. I just particularly love how the minimap is RuneScape. That, uh, that fills me with joy. This is a high quality meme, thumbs up. So then that brings us to something that's interesting, if potentially a bit mercenary, and that is creativity versus creativity. What's really going on here? This is the feel problem that some people are having with Palworld, where it essentially looks like we're just mashing up a bunch of things that already exist, and that's kind of that. And certainly looking at everything that we've seen from this company, they don't make the most unique games, in fairness. And in fact, a similar thing has happened on YouTube. Thankfully, it doesn't really happen in around the niche that we're in as much, but it has happened. Um, but you know the sort of Mr. Beastified videos where it's, you know, all, uh, I fell off a skyscraper for 24 hours in suspended animation for $3 million. But there's a bunch of videos like that, right? And you will actually see that some creator has basically found a video. I saw one about a capsule hotel. So somebody basically had almost the same title, practically the same thumbnail, and they just remade a viral video from like six years ago. Now, they still went, did the video themselves and all of that. But what they basically did, they market validated first by seeing prior viral videos to learn what would go viral in YouTube. And then they just went and made the same thing. Now, to a lot of us, we uh, wouldn't exactly say that that is the most pure creative process. Now, of course, as with everything, right, I, I do want to be very clear. There are lines here. As an example, it's weird saying I like a lot of Blizzard games, but no, I mean, hey, World of Warcraft back in the days, bringing MMOs out, making them more approachable to people, you know, boom, it explodes. But one of the things that people had long thought about Blizzard um, is that they don't necessarily invent the most new things, but what they end up doing is they wrap it up into a real good package that's like usable. Uh, it's a little bit like that with Apple. Do Apple invent half the things that they claim to have invented? 
No, no, they don't. But what they end up doing is implementing them in a way that I suppose just feels usable to the person who's not a power user. And that ends up being one of the reasons why uh, those Apple things are uh, pretty, you know, popular. So looking at Pocket Pair, like, this is a group of people that can obviously make some vidya. So then you wonder, well, wh why is all the vidya that you make so um, just this meets that with very little of you? Well, there's actually an interesting quote this is machine translated from their CEO and founder with Wire Japan. Now, he was talking about his tech background. He was working for JP Morgan, building web tools, founding a crypto exchange, and how he'd come uh, basically after he had attended a Nintendo game seminar where he'd taken a different approach to games. So he said this, I've always loved Nintendo games and that hasn't changed. I also deeply respect them. However, when it comes to making games, Nintendo has a strong philosophy of creating new and unique games with high quality. On the other hand, I have a deep-rooted desire for my work to be enjoyed by as many people as possible. And to that end, if there are good ideas in the world, I pick them up and I don't necessarily have to be particular about originality. I mean, there you go. He said it himself. Obviously, machine translated. Maybe there is some uh, nuance being lost, but that does make it pretty clear. And even just this line, I think it would be a good idea to create things in a way that just jumps on what is trendy. Lol. So um, that's interesting. He comes back to this idea, one influence from his software background, that basically taking something that people like and replicating it is uh, kind of smart. And hey, this is a thing in technology. I mean, I don't think they were originally Instagram stories. I think they started somewhere else. Snapchat, yes. Instagram just tried to like steal Snapchat. And then Snapchat was just kind of left uh, struggling because everyone stole its thing. So um, yeah. That, that kind of thing. It's very normal in tech. I mean, hell, even look at Twitter and threads. Now he goes on to say, famous indie games in particular are often strongly influenced by past masterpieces. I believe that culture develops through imitation. And then here's where it gets really interesting. So one thing that can happen with, uh, well, actually, if you want to test anything is you can do it via paid ad. As an example, you've probably seen the Diary of a CEO podcast. They actually, uh, they do these trailers, right, for their episodes. And what they do is over on Facebook, they do paid marketing campaigns for the trailer, but with different titles and thumbnails. So that by the time that they actually go to publish it in YouTube, they've already market tested what people will click on. So a very interesting process over in the gaming realm. Well, mobile games will... Uh, and by the way, this is different to the truly fake trailers that you see all over the place for mobile games, but um, some will actually release basically mock-up trailers of gameplay, and they will use that to inform what game they're going to make. So they could come up with a whole bunch of game concepts, then they come up with a whole bunch of trailers, and whatever trailer basically like performs the best via paid ad, that ends up being the game that they decide to make. So you could call that like smart testing, you know, smart marketing, smart game design that's sort of informed by what people will naturally click on and be interested in. Perhaps for, for something like that, th there maybe is a lesson, you know, here or there for people to learn. But when it's purely that, then I think for a lot of us who, you know, appreciate games as art, yeah, you're kind of diluting it and it begins to feel like it's all just some sort of race to the bottom derivative, you know, let's make something that everybody will be involved in but not give a shit about instead of making something that you know people will care about i'd far rather have less people play a game and actually enjoy it or have it be special to them so i think that's where i'd really criticize uh, his entire development ethos and with pal world you see it clearly right it is uh, a what if monster collecting but also automation survival designed for a very wide audience then with the whole pals and pokemon thing to be naturally mimetic and then sell absolute boatloads and to be fair to him based on what he has just said, right? He said, this is my philosophy. This is how we're going to be doing it. He only bloody well went and did it, didn't he? Because at the end of the day, as much as we may sort of read off all this, talk about it, and, um, you know, think in some ways that it's maybe a bit creatively bankrupt or something, you certainly cannot deny that at the end of this, what's happened? <laughs> They've made a shitload of money. And then, unfortunately, it can be pretty guaranteed that a lot of people are probably going to take a lesson from this. I mean, hey, people have long just thought, what if you put Pokemon uh, models, just drop them into Unreal Engine? Would people buy that? Turns out they would. <laughs> and even just think about the basics here, right? I mean, Pokemon, you've got 23.23 million sales for Scarlet and Violet. That's massive. You've got survival games. Those are massive. Then you've got those kind of automation factory games that are ever so incredibly sticky. 
So you merge these all together and you're obviously going to have some type of winning formula. Now, this being done in games is obviously like nothing new. We in fact very recently had an example with the day before because the day before was taking a bit of The Division, a bit of The Last of Us, uh, a bit of a few other things, uh, like GTA Online, remember that bizarre Lamborghini trailer? You're like, The Last of Us, but what if Ellie got in a Lambo? Very bizarre, but it did end up being the most wish-listed game on Steam, which sure is something. I mean, hey, even uh, take a look at Vampire Survivors. It was very openly a continuation of other bullet hells that just happened to hit very, very, very well. Valheim was taking some inspiration from Minecraft, bringing that into like a Viking setting. But of course, with the likes of uh, like, especially Valheim, they did a lot to make their take on it different and for the game to feel unique and uh, and fresh. Obviously, with Pal World, you can say the resultant of this big blender of existing things has felt fairly unique because I suppose there's not quite a game where you can have your not Pikachu or not whatever have a big gun and do shooting with it. But when you look at all of the blocks that have been put together, you can really see that they're not particularly original. And I suppose that's where we're left. The topic that I think will be the most interesting here is very, very obviously the whole plagiarism accusation thing. Because look, if Nintendo were to find out that like they, they just like ripped their models, I, I think you actually would have something serious there if Nintendo chose to pursue it. I mean, yeah, if hey, if you're a legal expert, especially in Japan, I would love to know like what the view of the law is on when that line is crossed to like legally be a problem. So do let me know if you have some expertise there. I, I mean, I would appreciate it. I'm sure all, all of the other uh, people viewing this channel would appreciate it. That's the situation for this story. If you want to dive into a fascinating, albeit rather grim one, about how Embracer Group has um, dragged down a hell of a lot more companies with it, oh boy, check out yesterday's episode. Other than that, well, that's it for me. Hope you enjoyed today's episode, and I'll see you tomorrow.